Welcome to Episode 9 of Nuked Radio. Today is Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. I am Ranchik. With me today is Jules and Kurt from Irritate the State, who has a show on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time. He's going to help us run some clips this morning. And we wanted to continue the interview that I had with uh, Jim Walsh. We ran a portion of that yesterday. In fact, our little show made any news. Um, the top viewed story today is CNN nuclear expert. I think MOX fuel is being used at U.S. reactors, which contradicts government claims made in Russia with weapons grade plutonium. So check out that article. So far, a uh, little over 2,000 people have read it today. It's very exciting. Um, I'm going to be asking Jim about cold shutdown. I'm going to be asking him also if GE could be forcing some suppression of news stories about uh, all things nuclear with their ties into the industry. And we're also going to be talking about A Theory of Fukushima by Arto Lori. And I dropped a link into the chat room if you haven't seen this. Something that bothered me endlessly were the mass bird deaths that occurred in January of 2011. And the government, their explanation of what killed all these birds were fireworks. But then we should have birds dropping out of the sky like crazy around July 4th every year, which we don't. So I never really bought that explanation, but Arto theories, uh, Arto Lori's theory actually... Uh, Add, added some credence to the possibility that it could be from ionizing radiation. So we'll go ahead and we'll play the first clip. What do you think about the term cold shutdown being used to describe the status of the reactors at Fukushima? I think it was euphemistic and uh, not technically correct. I think that was a political term meant to make the uh, surrounding population feel better and feel as if there was progress being made. I think we really don't know. I mean, certainly the plants are cooler than they were. There's no doubt about that. But it wasn't cold shut down in the way you would mean it, you know, of, of the plants that were, you know, five, six, and seven or, or, or whatever. So I, uh, you know, I, I get why they did that. I don't, I personally have some trouble with using those phrases because I think they can be misleading. It's, I think, safer than it was before and that it's cooler than it was before, but I think we still have a long way to go here. Do you know of any other plants in Japan that are having problems that aren't being covered at all, specifically Onagawa and Dayani? No, I don't know. You know, I, 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 I haven't continued to follow the fate of the other Japanese plants. My focus has moved more to, you know, sort of unintended consequences uh, rather than the the particulars of the other plants in Japan. So one of the unintended consequences here is Japan's uh, domestic nuclear industry has pretty much died, you know, for the foreseeable future. They were planning on ramping up, you know, from 30% of their electrical generation to 50% of their electrical generation. So they were going to build a lot more plants, and now they're not. So that big Japanese nuclear industry uh, that had a big domestic base suddenly has no market. And that has, what I've been looking at is that that has two implications, neither of which are particularly good. One is that in the absence of a domestic market, nuclear uh, firms in Japan will have to make up a, distance, a difference by exporting. And uh, they're not, they're sort of like Russia or the Soviet Union after Chernobyl. They're, they, they've got a wounded brand. Uh, and, but they have a real need to export. So what are they going to do? Well, they could try to compete on price, uh, but they may also uh, be less stringent in their non-proliferation requirements. Japan, uh, whatever its domestic nuclear situation, has always been an international leader in trying to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and insisting in their nuclear exports uh, on the highest standards and not transferring sensitive nuclear technologies like enrichment and reprocessing that could be used for the uh, building nuclear weapons. So now their industry is really in a hole, and there are one or two possibilities, I think. One is they begin to soften the nonproliferation requirements in order to be able to sell reactors overseas, and that's not good. Or the industry just up, ups and dies, which might sound like good news in the beginning, 
But if the Japanese nuclear industry goes away, export industry goes away, and then the main country that had was the strongest proponent of uh, strict nonproliferation is going to no longer be in the game. And it's going to be replaced by countries like South Korea and uh, China eventually uh, that really don't care about that and are more interested in just selling reactors and technology than they are in, in uh, nonproliferation requirements. So there are a lot of you know unforeseen consequences here, and one of them may be that uh, the Japanese nuclear industry begins to weaken its standards or it uh, goes out of business and is replaced by exporters who have even less uh, concern about the spread of nuclear weapons. So uh, I've, been I've been spending more time on those sort of unforeseen dynamics. Yeah, there was a, a problem that I had with one of his statements in that segment. He said that Japan has always been a leader for nonproliferation and not transferring sensitive nuclear technologies. However, he failed to mention that they ag agreed to enrich uranium for Iran in 2010. And this has been reported by four different sources, including the French press agency. And it's also um, part of the reason that we have so many conspiracies about Fukushima that are circulating. Because um, if, in fact, that is true, it would have made the U.S. and Israel extremely upset. Oh, I also found it difficult to uh, believe he's not following the fate of the other plants. Now, I've got a list that's not verified that there's up to 10 plants that are still having problems. Yeah, Jules? Uh, one of the things, just going back to uh, enriching uranium, um, I remember reading at the time that that was potentially the reason why reactor number three, when it exploded, uh, exploded looking more like a nuclear detonation versus a hydrogen explosion. Right. And nuclear fuel is not supposed to explode that way. And, and neither is a, a hydrogen explosion. In fact, for it to destroy those buildings the way that it did, they were actually um, over-engineered from the specs that GE gave them. They, were, they used fortified concrete. I believe it was five to six feet thick in some places. And it still blew out all over the place. In fact, if you looked at, looked at the pictures, uh, even the, the rebar is bent. Um, Jeez. I mean, that was a huge explosion, but of course, we've never had MOX fuel in a reactor that melted down before either. And that's what's so concerning to me with the um, decay rates that are being changed by sun flares that we talked about yesterday and the possibility, which, which he says is true, we are using this fuel in some reactors here in the States. I think it's really important that we find out which reactors are running that MOX. He says they're cooler than they were. <laughs> and what's the, with the plants 5, 6, and 7? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. There, we talked about that, that we yesterday. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a 7. <laughs> oh. So, um, Kurt, how was your BS meter on that segment in the interview? <laughs> Well, uh, it, it, it's still going off uh, from yesterday, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it is unreal. I, where, you know, I, the first thing I noticed was this guy didn't sound very uh, sure of himself. He didn't talk and speak with confidence. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of stuttering, a lot of stammering for his words. Mm -hmm. it's a good indication of uh, BS in my book. Well, I think that they, some of the nuke experts maybe underestimate some how much the, the people who are following the Fukushima story really know. Right. We'll, we'll be back in a few. We'll play the next segment in the interview. You're listening to Nuke Radio. Is that why we haven't seen you on CNN recently? I think you, you don't. Well, I do uh, I do a lot of TV. I do a lot of uh, CNN and a lot of Fox, but mostly it's on uh, nuclear weapons issues these days. So a lot of uh, Iran, a lot of North Korea. It seems to be very um, difficult to find 
any information on the mainstream media about Fukushima and, and sometimes even when the reactors are having problems over here, do you think that well, uh, the fact that uh, certain companies like GE and Westinghouse that build nuclear reactors also own these media outlets and that that's contributing to maybe a um, tamping down of information? I mean, it could be. I, I, I think... Um you know, normally the more complex the answer, uh, the more uh, explanation, uh, the less likely it is in general. That's not always true, but in general. I mean, GE could be trying to enforce some editorial um, suppression on uh, its media properties. I tend to be doubtful about that. I think the media have their, you know, someone who's done television interviews for over a decade, uh the, the most important thing to a media property is to have viewers or to have, if you're a newspaper, to have readers because that's how you make money. The, the, the media are not for-profit institutions. I mean, non-profit institutions. They're for-profit institutions. So the most important thing for them is to get viewers or get readers. And frankly, uh, interest in Fukushima waned and there were new issues that came up, whether it's the U.S. presidential election uh, whether it was the Iran crisis, whether it was the death of Kim Jong-il in December, rising gas prices. I mean, the, 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 the uh, standard media are voracious consumers of events, and they eat them up and they move on to the next one very quickly. There are very few issues where you get constant coverage over time because the news agenda changes. If they cover the same thing, people are, uh, get tired of it, they get bored of it, and then they go to the competing station that has the new story about the new thing. I think it's much more likely that than, you know, some sort of uh, corporate pressure. We need to visit the conspiracy realm for just a moment. Are you aware of the theory of Fukushima by Arto Lori? No. Arto Lori is a Finnish scientist who worked in new plants his whole life, and his theory of Fukushima was that, well, uh, first off, he said that Japan was running the unstable MOX, which they acquired from Russia and France. Some of it came from disarming of nukes, and Russia had reprocessed. Some came from leftover spent fuel from Stellafield and Super Phoenix. Anna Lavergian at the IAEA approved the use of this fuel and was later fired for it, according to him. For the first year, things went okay. Japan took 70% of this reprocessed mock. Until the Japan started opening the reactors for maintenance around the beginning of 2011. And it occurred to them that there was, th there was three times more heat and steam than what they expected. So they opened all the reactors, and this created such an enormous cloud of ionizing radiation that the IAEA and NATO thought the atmosphere might explode. They began using HARP to push down the radiation, and this acted as a conductor or iron nail to the ground, exciting the quartz and the rock, which started vibrating. The energy release and the plates caused the explosive release resulting in the 9.0 earthquake and tsunami. Yeah, I think that's absurd. <laughs> okay. I mean, really? First of all, you know, what does NATO have to do with any of this? Why is IAEA and NATO involved? You know, just, you know, if, when you have to spin a thousand different little things together to get one answer, and then and instead you have an answer that says Tsun uh, earthquake, tsunami, incompetence, I'll go with earthquake, tsunami, incompetence every day of the week. Yes, this um, this is something I get asked about a lot about his theory, and and I had actually asked Maggie Gunderson about her opinion, and she said, well, none of it's verifiable. But since then, I had come across your interview with Elliot Spitzer talking about the Russian mock, yep. and then I also came across some research from MIT that showed that the atmosphere above Japan heated rapidly before the 9.0 earthquake. There's actually diagrams of what the ionosphere looked like. Satellite observations showed a big increase in infrared emissions from above the epicenter, which peaked in the hours before the quake. In other words, the atmosphere was heating up. These kinds of observations are consistent with an idea called lithosphere-atmosphere-ionosphere coupling mechanism. The thinking is that in the days before an earthquake, the great stresses in a fault that is about to give cause releases of large amounts of radon. But the thing that kind of bothered me about these pictures is that they're perfect circles over the fault lines in Japan. 
And the other place I've seen perfect circles is in fallout maps around nuclear reactors. And we know that that's not true. That's not how the wind blows. And I wouldn't imagine that that's how what radon does when it's released from the ground either. Mm -hmm. But then, therefore, you know, that could all be true, but that doesn't generate the conclusion. Right? That's so far from the, you know, uh, is it uh, possible that uh, is it uh, scientifically plausible that prior to an earthquake there's a release? Sure, but getting there all the way to the other end of that explanation is a lot of steps, and, and some of them just don't don't sound right. You know, there are conspiracy theories, and there's a reason why people talk about you know sometimes the person who's paranoid is justified in being paranoid, but most of the time they are not. They're paranoid. And, you know, unless there's uh, some sort of something that follows a, follows a scientific method and collects data and evaluates that or is able to process trace and show how each causal linkage is, you know, you jump from A to B to C, then I think, you know, the, these things, you know, we have all sorts of conspiracy theories for all sorts of things, you know, everything. And they're highly complex and they're, you know, whether it's 9-11, right, is it, was 9-11 really carried out by the U.S. government? And, you know, is, was bin Laden really killed? Or was that just someone else's body that was dumped over the ocean? You know, I think a lot of that is just a big waste of time. So, um, <laughs> Jules? Yes. <clears throat> was he alluding to me being paranoid, do you think? <laughs> I think so. Unbelievable. I mean... I don't know. I actually saw the um, satellite footage that came out. Oh, I think it was a couple months after the Fukushima accident first happened. Um, but I believe it was from a, a either a NASA or a NOAA satellite where they had um, they had seen the ionosphere heating up over Fukushima before the big earthquake happened. And uh, it definitely, to me, looks very suspicious. So for him to be telling you that in so many words that you are paranoid, I think it's just crazy. I mean, he probably never even saw that satellite footage. Do you, you know, but that, that study was published by MIT, who he works for. And the, the, yeah. the problem that I had with it is if radon is leaking out of the ground as a precursor to an earthquake, it would be blowing with the winds and, and uh, one direction or another, it wouldn't be coming straight up like a smokestack and making a perfect circle on the ionosphere that's, you know, hundreds of miles above the earth. That's very true. And he agreed with you there. Yeah. And, and he had also confirmed the, the MOX fuel situation. And it was when I came across that interview a second time, I was like, wow. You know, maybe what Artillery was saying is correct. Mm-hmm. But the mass bird deaths are, are kind of explained by that, too, if there was a large cloud of ionizing radiation that drifted over here. The only thing about the bird deaths that I want to uh, add to that is that we also had in the same town, BB, Arkansas, mass bird deaths two January 1st in a row. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that this year. Not to the extent that they were last year, but it, no. it did happen again. All right, we'll be back for the last segment of the interview with Jim Walsh. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Watching her strolling in the night So I'm wondering Love that has gone away I'm gonna make a, a, a change today And we are back. I wanted to make a couple comments about uh, what he said about NATO monitoring radiation levels. Um, they actually do, as part of the Tempest program, which is a uh, classified project. It's very difficult to get information about it, and it's used for purposes of eavesdropping on computer programs. And you can look up Van Eck radiation uh, to read more about it, and it's been going on since 1985. And the IAEA also, you can search out a PDF on their safety standards that shows their environmental and source monitoring for purposes of radiation protection. So Kurt had an interesting 
observation about conspiracy theorists. Well, I noticed he uh, he wanted to throw paranoid in there like it, you know, and put a, a, a bad spin on it. Where, well, actually, I've heard, and, and I think, Jules, you, you as well, have heard that, you know, a, a paranoid person is somebody. Would, would, would you say it was, Jules, hyper-awareness? Or uh, hyper-informed is what hyper I was thinking. Hyper-informed, that's what it was. So somebody who's, you know, a, a, aware of their surroundings and the world around them and actually... Uh, have the gonads to question things as you're doing, Rad Chick, and, and, and many of us are, you know, that is paranoid on, you know, uh, actually a good thing. A little bit of paranoia is a good thing. Otherwise, I think you become complacent. Well, I, I sent him an article and, and thanked him for the interview. I sent him an article called 33 Conspiracy Theories that turned out to be true. <laughs> The Dreyfus Affair, the Mafia, MK Ultra, the Manhattan Project, asbestos, and the Tuskegee syphilis study where we injected poor African Americans with syphilis to see what it did to them. Um, those are just a few of the things, and I'll, I'll drop a link to that article in chat. So we have uh, one more clip to play. Well, then you're probably not going to like my next question. <laughs> Because I asked my viewers if they had one question to ask you, what would it be? Oh, no. And the most common question was this. Yep. Are nuke plants, uncontained meltdowns, atmospheric testing, and depleted uranium part of the globalist depopulation agenda? I don't know what the globalist, the globalist what agenda? Depopulation Depop agenda. Agenda 21. Yeah. Don't think so. You know, uh, first of all, those are all very different things. First of all, almost all nuclear power plants that are built today have containment vessels. That was the lesson from Chernobyl. You've got to have a containment vessel. It was only the Soviets who, in their closed system, uh, was able to ignore, you know, that rather important safety feature. So you have no plants that are built today that don't have containment vessels. They just, they just, that doesn't happen. And, you know, if you want to depopulate pe people, if you want to depopulate the planet, then start a war. You know, start a war in the Korean Peninsula. You know, uh, that's how you have India and Pakistan uh, get in a big uh, war. You know, have terrorists attack India and, and India responds and then Pakistan responds and you have a war. And you have several million people killed. If you're trying to depopulate the planet through marginal increases in radiation levels that lead to excess death rates over 20 years, that's a really slow way to do it. Um, since you did the Elliot Spitzer interview, have any other reporters contacted you to have you talk more about the MOX fuel from Russia? No, no one has. No. And has anyone, um, no one's mentioned to you either the decay rates possibly affecting the fuel in the reactors, especially with those tubes falling apart in San Onofre? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think the uh, it, uh, MOX fuel is something uh, that is being used, but that people are also sensitive about. And since it's only been, you know, in comparative terms, you know, we've had nuclear reactors for, for uh, decades now. And MOX fuel is a relatively new, uh, on that scale, is a relatively new uh, addition to the nuclear fuel cycle. So, uh, you know, it's not surprising to me that there's some concern about it and also that we don't have a lot of data on it because it's relatively new. Um, and it would be surprising if you introduced something new and there weren't, you know, things that you didn't expect. That's sort of the way the world works. So it wouldn't shock me if there were problems. Um, uh, and it wouldn't shock me if it, the jury's still out on it because it is relatively new. My last question is, what about the Carrington events? And if something like that happened today, what would happen to the new plants here? with the current state of our electrical grid and our transformers? Well, you know, I think if we're talking about relative risks, I think the biggest risks to the nuclear power plants here in the United States are the risks from the, uh, the, uh, at the 20 plus reactors that use the Fukushima design and the plants where we have multiple plants all sited near each other. I think that, and, you know, and then it's some combination of either uh, unexpected natural disaster because a lot of the plants are located like J Japan's near the ocean. Uh, you know, and you have rising sea levels and then you can have a highly unlikely, but even the highly unlikely happens 
external shock, an earthquake, a flood, uh, you know, uh, even these tornadoes or, or a terrorist attack that goes after uh, the, um, uh, the backup generation sy- uh, uh, systems and then therefore exposes the possibility that the spent fuel uh, won't be kept cool. I, I, you know, but the NRC is aware of that. Uh, whether I know they've made some changes, and they often don't publicize the changes they're making um, because they want to do it quietly for good reason or for bad reason. So, But I also know that some of the changes that they've enacted after Fukushima aren't due to actually be implemented for some quite some time. So I think it's fair to say that there continue to be vulnerabilities, and those are the vulnerabilities I worry about most. I saw this quote the other day, there's no greater disaster than to underestimate danger. Underestimation can be fatal. Yeah. I'm going to have to interrupt now. Uh, I have to leave. I've, we're at the 50-minute mark on the call. Yes. I have to pack and catch a plane. Okay. Well, thank you very much My for joining pleasure. us today. I appreciate all the information, and uh, good luck on your trip. Stay safe. And good luck on your with your radio program. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. You too, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye. Something I, I would wow. like for you guys to look up, and apparently Jim hasn't heard about this either, is a program that we started with Russia called Megatons for Megawatts. It's the name given to a program that was implemented in 1993 for the, Rus- for the Russian and United States Non-Proliferation Agreement to convert high en- enriched uranium taken from dismantled Russian nuclear weapons into low enriched uranium for nuclear fuel. But he says that all the data is new, but this program has been running since 1993. So I wonder if that's how long we've had this MOX fuel running in our reactors as well. And what's so interesting about this program is that they expect to run out of this fuel source in 2013. So could that be why they're looking to open up all these new uranium mines? I know um, Australia does quite a bit of uranium mining, but weren't they looking to do it um, in a few locations here in the States, like Grand Canyon or something, somewhere over there? And then I thought somewhere down in the south, too, they were looking to mine uranium. Yeah, I saw a story about the the Grand Canyon uh, mining project uh, that just came out this week. It's uh, posted on any news. But it's becoming very expensive to mine uranium, and then the quality that they're getting um, from the material is not as good as it used to be. And they kind of knew this um, when they started the nuclear reactor program, that eventually we would run out of uranium. So at that point, what do we do? And, you know, the funny thing is, like, none of these guys ever bring up solar, wind, geothermal, or free energy is like an F word to them. Um, In fact, (laughs) Dr. Walsh had a colleague named Eugene Malov, and um, he worked at MIT, and I believe it was in the mid-'80s. He uh, presented at a conference saying that we were just around the corner from having a free energy device for uh, widespread use, and a few weeks later, he was bludgeoned to death in his driveway. Oh, surprise. And, and Tesla, when he was actually doing work for the United States government, J.P. Morgan, who owned all the copper mines, found out about his uh, Furby Energy project. We, the federal government actually built Tesla a lab in Long Island, And uh, J.P. Morgan got the government to shut down that project, and they burned down his lab. So we'll be back with the last segment. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Nuked Radio. We're back with Nuked Radio. I'm going to drop another link into chat that kind of goes along with this. And we were just talking about off air um, the dead nuclear scientist list 
which is growing all the time. In fact, a lot of these scientists are from the Iran nuclear program. Uh, there's been a, a few. One was a, a motorcycle bomb that was attached to a car uh, within the last couple of months that was widely reported, and it killed not only the scientist but uh, severely injured the, his wife and another person in the car. And um, it's not just the nuclear scientists that have these uh, strange circumstances or the free energy scientists, but also um, biochemical warfare specialists. So I'll put that list into chat. And I also wanted to bring up to you guys, The Daily Show has gone nuclear. The nuke industry will use program for ad campaign that claims to display value of atomic power, trying to target younger audience. And somebody created a page on Facebook called Nuke the Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Check it out and feel free to leave your comments because uh, when they opened up this news story on Monday on any news, a lot of us were going there and commenting about what we thought about it and they actually disabled the feed for the comments. It redirects you to another page. I would like to make two comments about the Daily Show. Uh, sure. Number one, for for anyone who doesn't realize it, um, GE, I believe, is uh, part owner, if not the owner, of uh, Comedy Central. Are they not? Yes. 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 So how interesting is that? GE, who makes nuclear reactors, is now going to be promoting nuclear power on their television network. But secondly, back last year, uh, I used to be a big fan of John Stewart's, and after Fukushima happened um, and the EPA shut down all the radiation monitors, it was probably a month or two later, John Stewart had uh, Lisa Jackson, the head of the EPA, on as a guest. And so I, I dropped him a message. I said, John, you got to ask her about why the rad meters are turned off. You know, I figured he would, he would give it to her and, and, you know, get some tough answers. That man kissed her up and down. I mean, it was the most syrupy, disgusting interview I have ever seen. And he did not ask her one tough question, nothing about radiation. I, I was really upset about that. And I'm sure it had something to do with GE having their hands in Comedy Central. But that really kind of put the writing on the wall for me. Yeah, well, you know, Jim even said there could be suppression of information. Sure, I mean, that's business. And then, you know, he wonders why we're all paranoid. <laughs> right, exactly. You can't help but notice these connections, especially when you study Chernobyl and see what happened there and the right. way they suppressed information. And, in fact, some of the people that were um, working to, to understand and mitigate the Chernobyl problem, they turned up dead. Lagosev, who was the guy who had all the contact with the liquidators, and he was well known for his sense of humor – and he would joke around about the um, health effects of radiation with the workers all the time. And he hung himself in a stairway on the second anniversary of Chernobyl. And I mean, that he's just one on a, a long list of uh, suspicious circumstances and, and deaths in this industry, too. And I did a whole show with um, Popeye from Federal Jack about this. It's a two-hour show um, titled Conspiracy Theories Surrounding Fukushima. We talk about that, and we talked about um, Jim Stone and his theories that, uh, that Israel had, had put a camera in Reactor 3 and 4 that contained a nuke weapon. Yes, and I actually is, saw like, that. Yeah. You, have you seen pictures of that camera? Yes, I have. And they definitely didn't look like cameras, that's for sure. They were quite large. Well, the reason that camera was supposed to be so large is because it was a stereoscopic or 3D camera. And that's something I actually know about because I used 3D um, techniques. And I actually published a, a paper about using uh, a regular camera to shoot 3D or stereo of, like, everyday things, and um, I, that is not like any 3D camera that I've ever seen. And the other thing that kind of bothered me about the installation of those is that um, there's no reason to put a 3D camera in a hallway that's rounded, like the containment hallway, which is where it was installed, because well, you would only a... see about 20 feet. 
Wasn't it also an Israeli security company that was doing all of the installation? Mm-hmm. And that was as part of the, the conspiracy, too, that Jim Stone has written about, is that, um, you know, they, they were basically punishing Japan for agreeing to enrich uranium for Iran. And while they were in the plant installing these cameras, they could have installed Stuxnet, which would explain why so many systems failed in All terms months, of the yeah. cooling of the plants when the earthquake happened. And it was Israel and Mossad that created Stuxnet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that whole thing was very suspicious, to be honest. So I don't mind talking about conspiracies. If it gets more people interested in Fukushima, I think that's great. But I thought that the 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 fact that the, the Russian mox was true and these MIT ionospheric uh, satellite images showed these perfect perfect uh, circles above Japan was uh, was kind of compelling and maybe contributes to that theory. This Arto Lori guy, um, he's an activist now in Finland. He doesn't work in nuke plants anymore. And he actually has like a security team from the government that monitors everything that he does. Is he the Russian guy? Is it the Russian guy that's come out and talked about the different um, particles uh, emanating out of the plant causing issues? Or maybe he is... This guy's Finnish. Maybe he is Finnish, but he didn't speak English. No. No, I, I dropped a link to one of the videos. There's actually two parts on YouTube, and I have them on my channel. I think we probably have them on the feed to Fukushima Facts also. In fact, um, there's also links on there, too, for monitoring sun activity and earthquakes. And today is the 188-day cycle day. Yes, it sure is. I haven't looked at earthquakes yet today, but uh, today is supposed to be the day. Well, and some claim that that uh, date could extend a few days in either direction. So, you know, we had a pretty big earthquake in Mexico two days ago. So maybe that was the uh, the cycle, and ho- hopefully we won't have anything else happen. But a lot of the earthquake data too that we have, you know, isn't uh, um, isn't sufficient anymore because of the uptick. The data that they use for nuke plants and estimating the risk of of seismic activity um, it is completely out of date compared to what's going on now. And in fact, you you may have heard that. In Wisconsin, there's been three cities all within 100 miles of each other in the last few days where residents have been reporting big booms underground. Yeah, and all it's over. rattling stuff and shaking stuff. And their, their uh, mainstream news is actually all over the story. And then yesterday when I went to do a forecast, Wisconsin did seismic tests on its plants yesterday. And the Kiwani plant failed in terms of the, the cooling pipes, they said it wouldn't withstand the seismic activity scales. So I thought it was interesting that they decided to do this test in light of all the, the boom noises that are going on there. Have you, um, speaking of the boom noises and going back to the earthquake in Mexico, did you see that thing about there supposedly being a drill? That day? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. Someone had actually dropped me um, the flyer, and they said that they lived down there in Mexico, and uh, that that was real. So I don't know, though, 100%, but I thought that was somewhat interesting because isn't that how it happens? They're doing a drill and then some big accident. Yeah, they just did a a drill for the New Madrid, too, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Let's hope that that doesn't go. I'll put the link to the Daily Show um, in chat, too, so you can go and comment. Yeah, I we should all give the Daily Show a hard time. I have to say, I, John Stewart has been such a disappointment to me. Yeah, because I used he to really does, like him, too. Yeah, and, you know, he's got the viewership. I mean, he really could be making a difference to help us, and he's not. He's just falling and stuff. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that his brother is Mr. Bigwig Wall Street, he should have a conscience. Well, you know, he and and Rachel Maddow and Bill Maher and all these people that are kind of considered like almost alternative media, they should be all over the story. And they're not. 
Yeah, so we're, we're trying to fill the gap here at Nuked Radio. <laughs> And I hope we are. (laughs) We will um, be having a special guest tomorrow, Kevin Allen from Master of Many Things. He'll be stopping by to give us all his uh, detox and supplement uh, information, which I consider him an expert in the area, since he was probably the first one to create a website about this after Fukushima. So we're very excited to talk to him. And thanks for listening today. Thank you, Jules and Kurt, for your help, and we will see you guys tomorrow, same time.